November 1, 2025, Hi, I'm Mike Thompson, and welcome to 121 Point Mike. This is Ground School. In this video, I'm going to show you around VFR maps. There are a few special types of airspace that you'll see on charts, so let's look at a couple. Let's start with prohibited airspace. This is the type of airspace that uh, it means what it says. Stay out or expect bad things to happen to you if you go in. They start with a P and then designated by a number. And it's surrounded by this thin blue line with these little hatch marks around the perimeter. R is for restricted airspace. It just means that these areas are restricted, but air traffic control might vector you around or give you clearance to fly through it. If they do, you're okay. But I prefer to avoid restricted airspace by several miles, though, just, uh, you know, it avoids a headache. Restricted airspace looks just like the prohibited airspace, except that it starts with an R instead of a P. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Warning areas start with a W and look the same. So be on the lookout for things here uh, and check the notes over on the side just to see kind of what it's all about. Military operations areas and alert areas are this thin magenta lines with the hatch marks inside, similar to the restricted and prohibited airspaces. These are areas of military training activity, and so it's best to avoid them if you can, but there's nothing keeping you from entering. Uh, there are boxes and notes over on the side that'll tell you more about them, and it will give you the times and the frequencies and the altitudes so you can get more information about it, and so you know who to call if you need more information. This last bit of airspace on VFR charts we'll cover are the airways. These are the thick, light blue lines that run between the navigational aids, and these are the roads in the sky. They start with the letter V, uh, they're, so they're called Victor Airways, and then they contain a number to identify them, just like street names do. These are called, you know, they're Victor Airways because the phonetic letter for V is Victor, and that's how we use it on the radio. A very high frequency omnidirectional radio range, or VOR, is a beacon that sends out a rotating signal to a receiver in your plane. When you dial in this receiver frequency and set the proper radial on the, you see on the map there, then you can navigate along a Victor Airway. It's like you're driving down the road. You just have to turn on the correct road to get where you want to go. These roads are huge though. They can be up to 8 miles wide and they start at 1200 AGL and then extend up to the overlying airspace. Most places, this means that they go all the way up to 17,999 feet. You're not allowed to fly any higher under VFR. From 18,000 to 60,000 feet, that's Class A airspace, and it's not shown on charts either because it's everywhere. But we won't be flying there today anyway. Each of these Victor Airways is based on an outbound radial from the VOR or VORTAC. A VORTAC is a VOR combined with tactical air navigation that the military uses to navigate. They are very small on charts, but they're easy to find because they have these giant blue compass roses around them and all the radials leading away from them as well. The compass rose here has an arrow that points to magnetic north uh, in that area. Then the compass rose has the hatch marks about every 5 degrees and then numbers every 30 if there's enough space. The airways are marked with the exact radial on which you want to fly. You'll see the little boxes next to the airways that have a number inside and that tells you how far it is between the two nav aids. This keeps you from having to get your plotter out all the time and measure stuff. Let's look at a few of these airways, uh, navigational aids, and you'll see kind of what I mean. So if you look here at the Jonesboro VOR DME, you can see that its frequency is 108.6 in this box. Here's the identifier, and here is the actual Morse code spelled out for you so that when you listen to its identifier over your radio, you'll be sure that you actually tuned into Jonesboro. Now one interesting thing about this is you'll see that this particular VOR DME doesn't have any uh, airways leading out of it. So let's go over here and look at the Walnut Ridge. This one, it says it's a Vortac, but this one's a little interesting because the Vortac symbol is obscured by this GPS airway symbol, uh, this intersection MADI is right there in the middle. The Walnut Ridge Vortex frequency is 114.5. Its identifier is ARG, and there's that. Now, this one does have quite a few Victor Airways leading out of it. So let's head west here on the 273 radial. This is Victor 140. You can see this segment is 110 miles long, as indicated by this little box here beneath the airway. 
So it's 110 nautical miles between Walnut Ridge and Harrison. Harrison's frequency is 112.5, and here's its identifier. Now, just like a regular road, you know, that doesn't fly straight, you might get to an intersection and your road continues through the intersection, and it does here as well. There is a slight left turn to the 261 radial outbound from Harrison, uh, still on Victor 140, you can see there. So we came in here this direction, slightly north of west, and then we have to turn slightly south of west once we pass Harrison. 140 here, though, is only 44 miles between Harrison and, uh, what's this one over here? This is the Razorback VOR. And you can see here it just continues on. Um, 140 then goes through Razorback, headed west. This segment's only 81 miles, uh, still Victor 140. And this takes us all the way to Tulsa. And you can see Tulsa has quite a few airways leading out of it. Um, this one here, you can see, is Victor 88. If you're going to make a really hard left, you're going to be on Victor 74. If you want to continue straight on through, uh, this is a T route, which is GPS based. That one is uh, 422. Here's Victor 14, kind of to the south. All sorts of stuff. Other nav aids that you will see are non directional beacons or NDBs. They're not directional, kind of like their name says. They're just a tower that sends out a signal without radials like the VOR, but you can still track and navigate them. Um, but that's a different video. NDBs are shown as little magenta circles with the dot in the middle, and then they're bounded by a whole bunch of little magenta dots. You'll also see uh, random boxes kind of scattered all over the place with a bunch of info around and in them. These are radio aids to navigation. Typically, this is places where you can talk to someone and get info. So let's look at a couple of these as well. Here we are back at Joplin again. You can see this is the Joplin Remote Communications Outlet for Columbia Flight Service Station. We say Columbia Radio over the radio. And the frequency to contact them is given here up top, 122.6. A lot of flight service station communications are co-located with VORs. Here at Dreyer, near Cleveland, you can see here at the bottom, it is Cleveland Radio, the flight service station. Uh, at the top, you see this little R next to their frequency, 122.1. The R means that they receive on that frequency. So if you're going to call Cleveland Flight Service Station or Cleveland Radio, you're going to call them on 122.1. But they're going to call you back on 113.6, which is the VOR frequency. Now this will require a little bit of setup on your part. So you can call them up something like Cleveland Radio, um, November 121 Mike, transmitting on 122.1, receiving the dryer VOR, or receiving 113.6. So you're gonna obviously have to push your comm and your nav uh, through your headset on your audio panel so that you can hear them talk back to you on the VOR. But having an RCO co-located with a VOR station is quite common, and this is what you'll see many places throughout the country. And here on 122.6, you can get Bangor Radio on the Keen DME. Let's now look at some of the things to avoid, the sorts of things that are attached to the ground, or at least part of it, shall we? Big cities are yellow, uh, so stay at least 1,000 feet above them. Water is blue. There are train tracks, roads, pipelines, power lines, highways, plenty of stuff to orient yourself by. Towers are everywhere. The short ones look like little teepees and the taller ones look like towers. Next to each one, you'll see a uh, height in MSL of that particular hazard. Beneath that in parentheses is the actual height of the hazard above the ground. So you can do some math and figure out the ground elevation by subtracting the two numbers. Now you might be asked to calculate the ground elevation on a test. So here's a group of windmills, look at the little windmill symbols, and it's indicated uh, here by this dashed line, and it's given its height. Then you might have noticed these big blue numbers, evenly spaced, about, uh, they're what are known as quadrants. And these are the maximum elevation figures in that quadrant, given in thousands of feet by the big number, and hundreds of feet by the little number. Now, there's a systematic rounding and adding a couple hundred feet in each of these areas to make sure that you've got clearance, right? But why chance it? There are lines of latitude and longitude. Each of these little tiny tech marks is one nautical mile. 
the big tick marks are every 10. Notice though that how the east and west and north-south nautical miles aren't the same. And this is because the nautical mile is actually a 60th of a degree. Uh, you might hear this sometimes as a minute of angle. Since it's 360 degrees all the way around the globe, each of these little lines of longitude gets uh, closer together as you near the poles. And this makes the east-west distance shrink. Really though, you know, the distances aren't shrinking. That's just how it's shown on a map for consistency. Otherwise, the minutes would start disappearing and time travel is not possible. The north-south nautical miles are consistent though, and they provide a better gauge of distances. A nautical mile is actually about 6,076 feet. And uh, this is the distance that people are actually talking about when they say nautical miles. What's this uh, large, thin, dash magenta line here that's uh, got degrees east or west? These are the uh, magnetic variation lines. Anywhere along that line, the magnetic north will vary by true north by that amount. Uh, and this is important in flight planning when you're calculating your headings. I'll save that, though, for the flight planning video. Just know that your compass will read that far off uh, if you're on that line. Then there are these little thin gray lines with number and an arrow. What are those things? Those are the military training routes. The four digit ones are the low altitude ones below 1500 AGL. Uh, MTRs, kind of like Victor Airways, uh, but they're for the military. And they're uh, from four to 16 miles wide. So when you're crossing one of these on a trip, kind of be on the lookout for fast moving military stuff. Well, have you had enough? Uh, if so, that's okay. But if you're really into maps like I am, then you can read the FAA's aeronautical information and chart guides. Uh, they just have everything in there. And the link's in the description, of course. The charts have legends also that explain what the symbols mean if you're ever in doubt. They also contain the information for the special airspaces. So look on the side panels for the additional info that you're going to need to complete your flight safely. We've covered an awful lot of stuff. VFR charts are really fun to look at and they make for great decor. My hope is that you feel confident after watching this video that you feel like this is the most thorough VFR chart guide out there. I know it's a lot of info to digest in one sitting, so you can definitely uh, click on the particular chapter if you want to review it, but definitely play around with your charts and um, you can check the FAA's master guide you know, if you want more reference info. Lastly, just like I said, play around, um, planning your dream flights and things, and this is going to get you much more familiar with the charts. You can always email me with any questions, or you can connect with me on PalTap for a quick video chat. Sometimes the video chat, you know, is the best way to get an answer to your problem because it's a lot quicker than a back and forth email or comment chain. I want to make sure that you have the knowledge and are able to apply it on the ground and in the skies. Knowledge isn't power unless you can apply it. So stay with me on 121 Point Mike.